Uh, thanks, Rob, for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me to come and uh, talk to you today. As, as Rob mentioned, I spent 10 years at uh, Wellsbourne and never actually made it down here when we were part of the same uh, group. So it's, uh, it's a nice uh, uh, sort of to come down and, and visit uh, and, and see what, what goes on down here. Um, so today I want to talk, as Rob mentioned, about uh, crop uh, fertilizer use efficiency and also biofortifying crops. So I'm going to split the talk in, into two. Um, and a lot of uh, the work that I've been uh, focused on uh, over my career has been around phosphorus uh, and phosphate use efficiency in crops. Um, so I'll talk a bit about the work we've done on that uh, in brassicas uh, and linking it with some root traits and then also some of the transcriptional and epigenetic work that we've been looking at now to see um, uh, what, how these traits are controlled uh, at those levels. And then in the second part, I'll uh, talk to you about uh, a project that uh, finished last year uh, where we've been looking at biofortifying brassica crops with calcium and magnesium. So I'll start with phosphorus. So phosphorus is uh, essential to life. It's part of uh, uh, the DNA backbone, phospholipids, uh, ATP. Um, and plants acquire their phosphorus in the form of phosphate from the soil solution. Um, and one of the problems is that uh, the phosphorus uh, in the soil uh, forms very strong bonds with other elements in the soil quite strongly. So, so when the plants remove the phosphate from the soil solution, uh, many soils, um, it takes a long time for that phosphate then to dissolve back into the soil solution and replenish it. Um, and these old figures uh, here show some, uh, uh, the type of effect you can get around the roots. So the root would be growing through the centers uh, of, the, of these figures and we get a depletion of phosphorus around the root as it grows and absorbs the phosphorus from the soil. Now, <coughs> plants are, uh, have been around for a long time. Uh, they're well adapted to this. This is a, uh, an image about 200 kilometers north of Perth. This is one of the sand dune systems um, uh, on, the, on the coast of Western Australia. Um, and these plants are all quite happily growing in sand, which has less than about a milligram of, of phosphorus per, per litre uh, uh, or volume of soil. Um, uh, and, they're, and they're growing quite happily there. This is oilseed rape. Um, and this is what happens when you grow an oilseed rape plant. Um, it's you know, five times the concentration that those plants in Australia are growing at. Um, it's pretty pathetic and certainly not going to give you anything uh, worth, uh, worth harvesting. Now, I'm not saying we want to uh, take these plants and turn them into crops. Some of the, uh, um, some of the uh, adaptations these plants have for surviving out there are, are not what we'd want in an arable crop. Um, but some of the, some of the um, adaptations these plants have uh, may well be very useful in uh, transforming uh, these crops so that they are able to grow um, at lower concentrations of phosphorus. So to get around this problem that uh, we, we need to have uh, a bigger crops with more phosphorus, we obviously um, apply phosphate fertilizers uh, to our crops um, in the, uh, in the uh, Western world. Um, and that throws up a couple of problems. Primarily, the, the, the main problem is that the phosphorus that we use for our fertilizers comes from uh, inorganic uh, phosphate rocks, uh, which are uh, mainly either igneous or sedimentary in nature. Um, and it's estimated, depending on you, who you talk to, that we've got about 30 to 300 years uh, of supplies left. Um, so the optimists would say that we've got nothing to worry about for a while. The pessimists are panicking that uh, uh, we'll be running out of phosphorus next, in the next couple of years. So um, either way, it is going to run out as a, a cheap, reliable source of, of phosphorus. And uh, so there, um, <coughs> there needs to be a, a, a rationalization of our use goes into the uh, field. Uh, some of it sits there and, and, and gets absorbed by the crop over, over the years. Some of it um, is uh, eroded out of the uh, farm systems uh, directly into the watercourses. The rest of it is, is absorbed by the, the crop and either through the animal system as a feed, uh, through the animal, through to our diet or directly into our diets uh, and through the sewage system goes into the rivers. Uh, and in freshwater ecosystems, um, uh, excess phosphorus is, is the driver for eutrophication. Um, so this is some work that uh, Philip, I, Philip White at the James Hutton Institute and I did um, a number of years ago for DEFRA, looking at where all the phosphorus in the UK comes from. 
Um, and the important thing is this green um, section of these pie charts. These are river basin districts uh, that were set up for the Water Framework Directive across the UK. Um, and the green is the household contribution, which is essentially sewage. Um, and you'll notice that most of the areas in the UK are dominated by um, phosphorus entering the uh, water from, from sewage. Um, and this graph is the population density in persons per hectare versus uh, the load of phosphorus in, in kilograms per hectare per year going into the, into the river or fresh uh, the uh, surface waters. Um, and there's a strong correlation between population density and, uh, uh, and the amount of phosphorus entering those systems and the Thames catchment being the uh, uh, largest culprit. And there are um, uh, mechanisms now uh, it going into place to try and trap some of that phosphorus before it leaves the sewage treatment plants. Um, so although agriculture gets a, a bad press for, for being a major contributor to phosphorus in, in uh, freshwater ecosystems, uh, by far the biggest culprit is actually sewage treatment works. So, um, so I, in an ideal world, what we would like to see is, is be able to get our uh, optimal uh, growth um, at lower concentrations of phosphorus in the soil um, so that we're less reliant on those inputs. Um, and as we saw in Western Australia, there's plants have evolved lots of strategies to help do that. Um, they reduce their shoot growth, uh, uh, improve the use of the phosphate internally within the, within the plant. So they'll swap uh, phospholipids for sulfolipids and galactolipids, for example. Uh, below ground, they'll alter the, way, the position and the rate at which their roots grow. So they'll put more roots into the surface layers of the soil where a lot of the phosphorus is found. Um, they'll increase the root hair length and density and the, and the number of lateral roots and length and density. So that they're increasing the absorptive area uh, available for taking up the phosphorus. They'll release um, organic acids and enzymes into the soil which help release the phosphorus from inorganic uh, minerals and from organic sources. And they'll also make associations with mycorrhizal fungi and soil microorganisms, uh, which are uh, also well adapted to cycling phosphorus uh, close to the root, so that it's then available for the plant to take up. So from an agronomic uh, context, we're interested in how well that crop uses the phosphorus that we give it. Um, and this is a, uh, just a schematic of, of this. Um, the plant can use the phosphorus that we give it as a fertilizer and also the phosphorus that's uh, there present in the soil. And there are a number of processes that occur in the soil, cycling it through those microorganisms uh, from it organic and uh, inorganic forms um, into the soil solution to make it available for the plant. Um, but in terms of the plant, the, the Phosphorus use efficiency, can, uh, there's probably 20 or 30 different ways of calculating it, but they broadly fit into two categories. One is associated with the acquisition of the phosphorus from the soil, um, how well the plant can acquire the phosphorus for, uh, from, the, from the soil. Um, and the other is utilisation efficiency, so how well then, once it's got that phosphorus, how well it converts that into biomass and uses it uh, for, um, uh, for, for growth. Um, and depending on the, the context of the system you're working in, um, you may want to focus on, on one of these more than the other. So, for example, if you're in um, a, a well-fertilized field um, in, in the Western world where we have high levels of phosphorus in the soil already, um, actually the acquisition of the fertilizer is not necessarily the problem, but it's the, the way the crop uses it to produce biomass. So, well, all the work that I've talked to you about today is all focused on brassicas. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with brassicas, I just wanted to get, get some terminology straight up, up front. Um, for those of you not familiar, this is referred to as used triangle. And it's the relationship between the um, genomes of the, uh, the main commercial brassicas, or the main uh, cultivated brassicas, sorry, um, that we have uh, in the world. Um, and they center around three genomes, the A genome, the B genome, and the C genome. All the work I'm going to talk to you today is along this bottom axis here. Now I'm going to talk to you about Brassica oleracea, which is the C genome. And this is uh, the cabbages, cauliflowers, and things that you would classify as, as vegetable brassicas. 
On the right-hand side, we have Brassica rapa, which is the A genome. This is the turnips and Chinese cabbage. Um, this is particularly important because it was the first one of these uh, genomes to be sequenced, um, and that makes it uh, more, more useful in terms of experimental work. Um, and so uh, some of the work may have been better done in Brassica napus, but uh, genetically um, uh, there just wasn't the resources available at the time to do it. And then in the middle we have this amphidiploid where we have the A and the C neat genome joined together to give us all seed rape. Um, so, so these are the three sort of species I'll be talking to you about today. And if I mention C genome, I'm referring to Oleracea or A genome, Brassica rapa. So as Rob mentioned, I did my PhD at Wellsbourne. And at Wellsbourne, we have the national collection for um, C genome diversity, so oils, vegetable seeds uh, for uh, Brassica oleracea. So we have a fantastic collection there of over 3,500 uh, different varieties of, uh, of uh, vegetable um, brassicas um, that we were able to utilize and look at the variation in some of the traits that we were interested in. Um, so this graph shows the agronomic phosphorus use efficiency. This, this is the amount of dry matter the plant puts on for, uh, per gram of additional phosphorus fertilizer we give it. And uh, there's two populations of um, plants here. One is this DFS, which is the diversity foundation set. And that's a subset of those 3,500 brassica lines that we've got at Wellsbourne, which represents pretty much all the diversity in that collection. And as you can see, there's a large variation in this uh, measure of phosphorus use efficiency within that population. Um, and we did this for several other measures of phosphorus use efficiency. I'm just uh, putting this one up today just to give you an idea of the, of the variation that we see. And then these, this population here was a collection of commercial cultivars that were available at the time. And one thing to note is that the, the solid bar, which is the mean, um, for the commercial cultivars is actually higher than the actual variation we see in the uh, sort of wider diversity of, of oilseed rape. Um, and so inadvertently, breeding for these commercial cultivars and primarily breeding for yield and, and biomass accumulation in things like cabbages, um, what the breeders have been doing is inadvertently breeding for phosphorus use efficient, more phosphorus use efficient crops. So they've been putting on more biomass, but haven't proportionally been taking up as much uh, uh, the same amount of phosphorus. So we're essentially getting more phosphorus, uh, more biomass for, for our unit of phosphorus uh, invested. Um, so within Brassica uh, oleracea and vegetable brassicas, we seem to be getting uh, more phosphorus use efficient varieties anyway uh, through uh, commercial cultivar breeding for, for yield. Um, and at the genetic level, we used a, a mapping population in, in vegetable brassicas, and we were able to identify a number of regions in the um, C genome of Brassica oleracea where there seems to be uh, large effects for uh, controlling a lot of these traits. So this is chromosome 3 and 7 in, in Brassica oleracea, where we get a number of these traits um, co-occurring at the same uh, locus within the, within the genome. So um, I mentioned earlier that um, plants are, um, uh, have evolved a number of strategies related to their roots in terms of improving the acquisition of these nutrients. And we were interested to see whether um, the high phosphorus use efficiency varieties also had um, improved root systems. Um, and we do find there's a, a strong correlation between um, the higher phosphorus use efficiency uh, in these varieties and um, it, root traits um, in particular. Um, so these, uh, this variety here was one of our low phosphorus use efficiency varieties um, and it has a very um, slow growing short primary root with very little lateral roots coming off it. Um, and these two are some of our high phosphorus use efficiency varieties um, and the, the root growth is a lot more vigorous. We have a lot more lateral roots coming off that um, and, and these are traits that would, uh, in, uh, we would associate with improving the acquisition of, of phosphorus uh, in the plant. Um, and this uh, graph shows um, the, we grouped our varieties into different groups depending on how, whether they were phosphorus use efficient or not. And groups three and four were the most phosphorus use efficient. And these are different measures of lateral root, number of lateral roots, the lateral root length, and the lateral root growth rate. Um, and there was a strong correlation between these traits and, and having a higher phosphorus use efficiency uh, in, in the plants. 
So moving away from vegetable brassicas now and into oilseed rape, um, we also had access to a collection, uh, a similar collection of diversity um, lines from uh, Brassica napus. And we were able to do the same screening um, approach to look at phosphorus use efficiency of traits in that. So again, this is a, the same measure of agronomic phosphorus use efficiency. This is the Brassica napus diversity foundation set now, which contains uh, a large variety of uh, variation within that collection. Again, commercial varieties that were available at the time. And this is a mapping population, a tapador, ningu, double haploid mapping population. And again, as with the uh, vegetable brassicas, we see a large variation in, in this trait. Not so much now in the commercial cultivars. Um, and while their uh, vegetable counterparts are primarily bred for, this, uh, for biomass yield, um, the, the, the oilseed rapes are, are bred for um, grain yield, um, which um, so, so, uh, so you bred for grain yield, which doesn't necessarily um, uh, have the same interactions with the uh, phosphorus uptake and, and biomass accumulation. Um, so there doesn't seem to be any uh, breeding inherently for phosphorus use efficiency in the uh, oilseed rate breeding programs. And again, we were interested in, in what root traits, uh, whether there's any root traits associated with this. Um, and so looked at the root traits in uh, the variation across the um, uh, diversity foundation set for oilseed rape and got um, some very contrasting root phenotypes uh, within this population. So this is uh, uh, what we would characteristically see when we give a plant optimal phosphorus. It has a long primary root and a few lateral roots. Um, it's not desperately trying to forage for phosphorus from the, from the surrounding area. And when we give it low phosphorus, the primary root stops growing and we get uh, longer, more dense lateral roots being produced to try and expand the uh, volume of soil it can uh, accumulate phosphorus from. Um, and then within, that, within this diversity um, collection, we also identify varieties where under optimal phosphorus, we have these long, dense lateral roots being formed. And, and when we give, give them low phosphorus, we get a reverse of that phenotype. It's just a long, um, um, thin primary root with very few lateral roots associated with it. So there's a large variation within that population um, uh, in terms of, of, of root traits. Um, and then in collaboration with uh, Professor Shli at the Huazong Agricultural University in, in Wuhan in China, uh, we set about looking at this um, TN mapping population in terms of their root traits. Um, uh, and this is uh, the response of Tapador, the two parents, to uh, phosphorus availability going from uh, zero to uh, optimal concentrations. And you can see this uh, characteristic, again, response where we have a long uh, primary root under high phosphorus and, uh, and lots of lateral roots under, under low phosphorus. But there are some differences between the two parents in this population in terms of how they respond uh, to that. Um, so Professor Schley came over to the UK and, and screened uh, 202 double haploids from this mapping population. Um, and we were able to then identify QTL associated with a large number of traits. Now, Professor Schley's group in China is also using this population and they've been doing it at the field level. We, this was a rapid screen over two weeks in a, in a, gla in a growth room. Um, and he's been looking at yield and biomass traits in the field in China uh, uh, over the whole season. So we've been able to um, then correlate some of these um, uh, rapid screen trait data from, uh, from the growth room with some of the field-based uh, data that he's been collecting uh, in China. Uh, one of the interesting things was that um, in, in brassicas, the, um, the chromosomes between the A and the C genome um, share very similar structure. Uh, uh, they're they're syntonous in their, their gene order and structure. Um, uh, and the A3 genome is, uh, the A3 chromosome in the A genome part of Brassica napus is very similar in structure and, and to the C genome. And in Oleracea, in the C genome, we found lots of QTL associated with phosphorus use efficiency on the chromosome C3, uh, which I showed you earlier. Um, and in uh, the Brassica napus, we see these coming up uh, quite dominantly on the A part of that genome, um, 
on the chromosome A3. Uh, and we also get some uh, 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 QTL coming um, out on, on C9 uh, in the Brassicanapus. Sorry, I should say that each segment here represents one of the chromosomes in, in the AC genome, and each circle within this represents one of these traits with CG, the outermost circle, and lateral root angle right in the middle. Um, uh, and we were able to get co good correlations between some of the seed um, yield data and some of these lateral root traits um, in, in Brassica napus. So moving on now, um, from so we've characterized that, and Professor Schley is in China as, as part of a, a crop improvement research club project with Martin Broadley at the University of Nottingham is now fine mapping some of those regions in uh, Brassica Napus to try and identify the genes that are underneath some of those uh, QTL regions. Um, moving on now to some of the work we've been looking at now using um, expression QTL analysis to try and understand which genes are uh, controlling some of these traits. Uh, and for this work we've moved into Brassica Rapa well, primarily because it's been sequenced before. It's now been sequenced, and there's a lot more um, experimental populations and resources available to us uh, in this species. So this uh, work we've been doing using a cross between um, a, a line called R500 and IMB211, and this is a rapid cycling line, so it can go from seed to seed in about 12 weeks, which experimentally makes uh, life a lot easier for us. Um, so for those of you not familiar with expression EQTL, uh, or genetical genomics as it's sometimes referred to, um, rather than taking a trait such as biomass or crop height or, or yield as a quantitative trait, we take the actual expression value of the gene as our quantitative measure. So for example, these are just 25 random genes and they're normal against their normalized expression value. And each one of these dots represents the signal value from a, uh, for, that, for that gene from a member of a mapping population. So if we're screening a mapping population of 80 lines, there's 80 dots here, uh, and each dot representing one of those lines in the mapping population. Um, and you can see some genes have very tight, uh, there's not very much variation in, in their expression, whereas other genes, we get large variation in the expression of that gene across the mapping population. Uh, so we can identify some of the genes and the genetics, uh, the genetic components that are regulating those genes in the context of some of the traits that we're interested in, such as phosphorus use efficiency. Um, so for this, uh, for phosphorus use efficiency uh, and, and phosphorus availability, we looked at 78 lines from this mapping population um, uh, and uh, optimal and low phosphorus availability we identified a large number of genes that responded to phosphorus that were up and down regulated, which are consistent with those that we've seen previously in response to phosphorus deficiency. Um, um, and what it allows us to do, so we run a QTL analysis then for this, these expression values for each gene, uh, and that gives us then a genetic position in the genome that's associated with the variation in the, in the expression of that gene. So that's the genetic position. And because Brassica RAP has been sequenced, we also have the physical position of that gene. So we've got two locations, a physical location where it is in the genome and a genetic position uh, where there's something that's controlling the variation that we're seeing in that expression. So along the x-axis here, we have the genetic position in centimorgans. And along the y-axis on this top graph, we have the physical position in base pairs. And if you sort of stand back and squint, you can see a diagonal line running across this the graph. This is called the, referred to as the cis diagonal. And this is where the physical position and the genetic position coincide. So the, the gene um, is being controlled at the location where it is in the gene. And then there's a, uh, within the genome, sorry. And then there's a large scatter of dots around this cis diagonal, which are referred to trans EQTL. And that means that, uh, for example, down here, we've got a gene which is physically located on chromosome one in, uh, in Brassica Rapa, but there's something on chromosome 10 there that's affecting the expression of that gene. So it may be a, um, a transcription factor um, or, or, or some other um, genetic element that's regulating the expression. Um, and down here, we just then have a number of e the number of EQTL um, um, associated with each marker that we've got in our genome. 
and you'll notice that there are some markers which have more uh, EQTL associated than, with them than, than you would expect by chance. Um, and we're particularly interested for phosphorus in this one on chromosome A6, um, which has a large number of EQTL associated with it, and it's overrepresented with genes associated with phosphate responses uh, or plant responses to phosphate stress. Um, and I've just got a PhD student uh, starting this year who's starting to look at what's, what it is under that um, uh, region of uh, A6 that's regulating all these genes. And we're hoping it's some sort of master regulator of phosphate responses, but uh, we shall, we'll, we'll wait and see on that one. Um, so finally, the last part of the puzzle that we've started to look at now is the epigenetic regulation of some of these traits and whether there's any um, uh, epigenetic imprinting in response to phosphorus deficiency and stress uh, in plants um, and, and how that's manifested uh, itself. And particularly we're interested in uh, the methylation patterns associated with some of the genes that we were interested in and whether they change under phosphate uh, deficiency. And this is some of the work that uh, I've been doing out in Australia. Um, for this work, we've been looking, we've been using a, a, another line, a, a Brasca RAPA RO18, which again is a rapid cycling line so we can uh, get through a, a large number of generations in the glass house. It's also been used as a, for a number of genetic resources, such as the uh, tilling population, which I'll discuss later in the context of the biofortification work. Um, so we do uh, these experiments hydroponically in the glasshouse um, so that we can control the nutrients that were available to the plant. Um, the plants were grown um, hydroponically um, on full nutrient solution uh, for, a number, for a couple of weeks, and there were a number of genes involved in um, the uh, synthesis of uh, galactolipids, which are replacing phospholipids uh, in the thylakoid membranes, um, and genes involved in uh, uh, breaking down phosphate containing um, molecules in, in the plant to release the phosphorus to be used for more essential uh, purposes. Um, the DNA then went off for bisulfite sequencing. Um, so for those of you not familiar, in the, in the, um, uh, the DNA, we can, the methylation occurs on cytosine um, uh, bases. Um, and when we bisulfite treat the um, uh, DNA, those ones that are methylated remain protected and stay as cytosine uh, residues. But when uh, they're not protected, they're not methylated, they get converted to uracils. So when we sequence that, we can see which, uh, we can use that with reference to uh, uh, the genome sequence, which bases have been, uh, which cytosine residues have been methylated and which haven't, and whether there's any change in that uh, by our treatments. So this work was done in collaboration with Graham King's group at Southern Cross University. Uh, the, I seek there uh, to do this work. Um, um, and this is the uh, methylation profile of uh, the Brassica RAPA genome, uh, where we've treated it with low phosphorus and high phosphorus. Um, at the genome level, it's very difficult to see any sort of difference in that. Um, you get a natural uh, higher occurrence of these methylation events around the uh, centromeres of the chromosomes. Um, and then this is chromosome 1. So when we start looking uh, uh, more closely now, we start to see areas where we're getting differences in methylation between <laughs> our treatments. And I've just got one example here. This is a, a phosphatase-related protein which uh, releases phosphorus from uh, um, from uh, molecules in the plant, and we can see there's differences between our high and low uh, phosphorus-treated plants um, in terms of the methylation pattern uh, within this gene. Um, uh, this is uh, relatively new uh, data, and he had it um, uh, for a couple of weeks, um, and we're still ongoing with this. So one of the things that I do need to caution about with this data is that it we've only got one run of data for it yet. Um, we haven't got the replicates analyzed. So, um, uh, so this may change or, or may improve, hopefully improve. So coming to the end of the, sort of the phosphorus work, we've demonstrated there's a large variation in phosphorus use efficiency in root traits within uh, brassicas. Um, root traits um, do correlate with phosphorus use efficiency uh, in, a, in a lot of the brassica work that we've looked at. And we've identified a number of genomic locations within the A and C genome um, which uh, share common um, regions 
and we're in the process of identifying what genes are that are underlying those. And now we're looking now more at the transcriptional and epigenetic regulation um, of these traits. So I leave the phosphorus work behind now, move on to our work with uh, brassicas in, in the context of uh, biofortifying them with, with calcium and magnesium. And as, as I mentioned, this project was a, this is a BBSRC project that ended last year, and it was between myself and Martin Broadley at the University of Nottingham, Graham King, and then Chris Rawlings at Rothamsted Research, and, and Philip White at the James Hutton Institute. Uh, and it was uh, funded, part funded by uh, the fertilizer manufacturer Yara um, as part of the BBSRC award. So the project was set in the context of hidden hunger, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, the uh, UN Food and Agricultural Organization defines global food security as having sufficient, safe and nutritious food um, uh, to meet your dietary needs. Um, and they estimate that about 870 million people globally don't have sufficient food to eat, so that's enough calories to sustain a, that healthy, active lifestyle. But in addition to that, they estimate there's about 2 to 3 billion people globally which are deficient in, um, in that nutritious category. So they, so they have enough calories uh, in their diet, but they're not getting sufficient minerals and vitamins through their food into their diet. And the graph down the bottom shows where the prevalence of this is highest. And as you expect, it's uh, a, a lot of developing countries in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia which are most prone to it. But what's interesting is that um, it's not purely associated uh, with those regions of the world. So in the UK and the US, um, there's probably estimated to be about 25 million people which are deficient in calcium magnesium in their diets. Um, so about 9% of those populations. Um, and it's especially prevalent, uh, particularly uh, in females as well, and partly through, uh, through dietary choices that people make. Um, some subsections of the population, um, the incidence of these deficiencies are, are much more significant. Um, but why is this widespread in, 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 a, in a Western society? We're not uh, calorie uh, deficient, um, we're not, and our calories aren't relying on a single source of, uh, of uh, dietary intake, such as some countries in sub-Saharan Africa where sort of 95% of their diet comes from maize. Um, we, we have a relatively diverse uh, diet, despite the sort of uh, five-a-day fruit and veg um, uh, initiatives. Um, you know, we are getting towards um, taking up more and more fruit and veg in our diets. So this is some old uh, uh, data from 2008-2009, but um, these newer data is showing that our fruit and veg intake is uh, increasing. Um, <clears throat> so how can we combat this? Um, one of the ways is to uh, artificially supplement our diets with, uh, with vitamins and minerals. Oh, and we can do that voluntarily. We can pop down to Boots or Holland and Barrett and pick up some vitamin tablets. The likelihood is that we'll forget that we've brought them and they'll sit at the back of the medicine cabinet for a few years um, and then we'll bin them. So, so there's a, you know, reliability issues there. One of the discrepancies in this data for calcium is that in the UK we have a slightly lower, we have a lower incidence um, in the percentage of people not having sufficient calcium relative to the US. One of the reasons for that is in the UK we mandatory um, fortify our um, processed wheat flour with calcium phosphate. So all the bread uh, and, and uh, cakes and things that we eat um, contain calcium um, supplementation uh, as uh, mandatory um, in the UK. Um, so we have a, a slightly better record on calcium than, uh, than the States where that's not uh, achieved. And there are a number of countries globally where they do this for other elements. So uh, in New Zealand, selenium is added into certain products to increase the selenium concentration in the diet. One of the best ways we can do it is to diversify our diet, um, you know, I, which is relatively simple in a, in a Western nation where we can go down to a supermarket and probably whatever time of year pick out uh, every item on this graph. Um, not so easy in, in some parts of the world, though. 
Um, and the Royal Society Reaping the Benefits report recognised this, that diversifying the diet was the uh, best way of, of maintaining and increasing our dietary intake of, of these nutrients. Um, but they also recommended that biofortifying varieties may provide a short-term solution uh, until that uh, takes effect. So what do we mean by fire fortifying a, a food crop? Well, in, in essence, there's two ways that we can do this. We can either breed a variety which takes up those nutrients more efficiently and has them in the edible portions of the, of the crop, or we can give the crop more of that nutrient so that it can take it up. So we can fertilize with a particular nutrient uh, and in, in increase the uptake of that crop. And there are a number of global initiatives that um, are exploring this, Harvest Plus and Harvest Zinc, where they're looking at um, agronomic and breeding um, initiatives to increase iron and zinc concentrations in, in crops. <coughs> um, and this is an example of some work that um, Philip White and I did, <coughs> looking at so, uh, zinc um, but, uh, foliar applications in, in potatoes. Um, and the more zinc you apply, the more zinc you get into the crop. Um, so um, it does work, but not for every element and in, under every circumstance. So why are, we, why are we working with brassicas in this? You think, oh, well, if you want to get people to eat stuff, you put it in something like wheat or rice or uh, something that's uh, consumed quite heavily. One of the problems <coughs> when we're thinking about where we uh, put these nutrients is it has to be in the edible part of the plant. So we're considering uh, we either put them into the, the tubers the leaves or the roots or into the, um, uh, the grain uh, or the fruit of the crop. One of the problems with calcium is that it doesn't like moving around in the phloem. The phloem is a living structure and calcium is used by plants as a signaling molecule. So putting lots of calcium through living cells tends to mess up the signaling um, cascades in the cells. So calcium moves into the plant apoplastically uh, in the roots uh, by a, before the Casparian strip is formed uh, in the root tips into that, through up into the xylem and then into the leaves and the actual movement then through the xylem to the fruits and the seeds or back down to the tubers is relatively slow and inefficient. Um, and as a con uh, you're probably familiar with things like blossom end rot in tomato, um, that's a calcium deficiency, the, not necessarily in the plant uh, per se, but in the ability of that plant to supply sufficient calcium to the growing uh, fruits uh, of the plant. Magnesium is not so much of a problem, it will move around in the phloem. But certainly in the context of calcium, where we've just got it moving in the xylem primarily, uh, the best target tissue is, is either the root or the leaf, where we're getting uh, the, the main deposition of calcium. So we're looking for a leafy crop that we can put calcium uh, into. In the context of biofortification, we also need to consider um, dietary inhibitors uh, such as phytate and oxalate. <clears throat> these are compounds which are found naturally in the plants which then bind to a lot of these uh, uh, minerals. So um, they'd make them then less available to us dietary, uh, for dietary intake. And this just shows the absorption uh, in a human diet versus the amount of phytate added to the diet for iron, zinc, calcium, magnesium more phytate you put in, the less mineral is absorbed. And some plants have quite high concentrations of phytate and uh, oxalate in their leaves, but fortunately brassicas don't. At the phylogenetic level, brassicas also have, um, this is a, a leaf calcium concentration, leaf magnesium concentration, for um, a representative sample of all the angiosperms. Uh, uh, and at the, on average, brassicas have higher calcium magnesium concentrations than the rest of the angiosperms and, and that's in the context of spinach which has high magnesium but actually has lower calcium concentrations and spinach leaves also have a lot of these um, uh, anti-nutrient uh, uh, factors in them as well. And then from our work in Brassica oleracea this is the uh, uh, variance components are the, uh, associated with the genotype. So the her heritability of, of this, of calcium and magnesium concentrations in the leaves is relatively high. So there's good potential there to, to breed for, for these traits. Um, so we started off this work uh, setting up our, our assay. This is the external magnesium and calcium supply for three, uh, the two parents of that mapping population I showed you earlier, an RO18. 
um, and this is the leaf calcium concentration and, and magnesium concentration. So from this data we were then able to select a number of treatments where we were supplying low or high or, or combinations of those uh, levels of um, calcium and magnesium in the soil to try and uh, um, manipulate the amounts accumulated in the leaves. And then we were able to do this across the mapping population as we did before for the uh, brassica oleracea, uh, for the phosphorus work, um, to identify some of the, the genes uh, which vary uh, in the context of calcium and magnesium supply and what regions of the genome there are so that variation is associated with. So this is the same graph that I showed earlier but for this calcium magnesium work where we have the physical position and the genetic position uh, uh, associated with the, uh, with the variation in the gene expression. And we get this, this diagonal again um, and a large spread of data. And we identified nearly 10,000 EQTL with this data. Um, and there's a number of regions in the genome where we have uh, unique hotspots associated with calcium and magnesium um, uptake uh, in, in, the, in the plants. So one of the problems is that we've got 10,000 EQTL and a large number of um, uh, regions of the genome associated with it. Um, so fortunately Brassica is very closely related to Arabidopsis and we're able to use some of the Arabidopsis resources to focus in on some of the uh, targets for our, for our work. And this just shows the Arabidopsis genome versus the Brassica RAPA genome. So the five chromosomes of Arabidopsis versus the ten of Brassica RAPA. Um, and you'll notice for each region of Brassica um, Arabidopsis, for Arabidopsis um, it's th there are three sections in Brassica uh, Rapa. So it's gone through a triplication event um, uh, from between Arabidopsis and Brassica Rapa. So potentially there's three copies of each gene in Brassica Rapa, um, which is one of the reasons we use Brassica Rapa rather than Brassica Napus, because there's potentially six copies of each gene in that, and that's uh, even more of a headache. So, um, so using this um, collinearity and syntony between uh, Brassica and Arabidopsis, we are able to look at um, some of the Arabidopsis data that we have on calcium profiles uh, in the leaves of Arabidopsis lines um, to identify some genes that we might want to take forward and focus on. Um, so Dave Salt's group, originally at Purdue University in the States and now Aberdeen uh, University, um, have for a number of years been looking at uh, um, mineral elements in the leaves of Arabidopsis lines and accessions and mutants. And he's put all that data quite helpfully online so that we can go and have a look at it. Um, and we're able to, so there's uh, over 150,000 different samples of Arabidopsis uh, material on there. And he's ha for each of those samples has the calcium, magnesium, zinc, potassium um, profiles uh, of, of the leaves. So we're able to identify Arabidopsis lines which have a calcium phenotype. Um, and working back through that, identifying ones which have been associated with unique Arabidopsis genes. So where he's uh, screened a, muta a mutant knocked out in a particular gene. Um, and from this we were able to identify uh, 36 of our EQTL which mapped to 15 Arabidopsis genes. And they included um, these uh, three genes here, CAX1, CAX3 and ACA8. And they're calcium transporters. Um, so A, we're quite pleased that that's the followed through and, and linked up quite nicely um, and it gave us some focus on what to uh, target in the next stage of the work. Um, the CAX genes work, uh, sit on the tonoplast and they sequest calcium into the vacuole and our AC8 gene sits on the plasma membrane and exude, exudes um, calcium out of the, uh, uh, as a channel out of the uh, plasma cytoplasm. Uh, maintaining the calcium concentration in the cytoplasm at a low level to permit those uh, calcium signaling events. Um, so it wasn't too much of a surprise. CAX1 has been identified previously as being important for calcium accumulation in plants. Uh, there's a number of groups around the world who have overexpressed it in, in carrots and lettuce to increase the calcium concentration in those uh, products. Um, so this was our CAX1 gene in, in Brassica Rapa. It's an eight transmembrane spanning um, uh, protein. Um, and 
what we're interested in is, is um, uh, manipulating that and looking at uh, what happens when we alter the, uh, the um, mutate it. Uh, to do this, we use the uh, RevGen UK uh, Braska RAPA mapping uh, tilling population. So this was in that uh, RO18 background line. Um, and we went through uh, identifying the gene, um, ident uh, acquiring the seeds from, from RevGen, back crossing those lines and uh, generating F2 plants, which we phenotyped using a high resolution uh, Melker uh, method to identify homozygous lines for our, for our mutations. Um, and so we identified a number of mutations in this N-terminus region of the, of the protein, um, which uh, gave us um, uh, amino acid um, shifts uh, in the protein. Uh, and we were able to then phenotype those um, so for each, uh, there's three uh, mutants represented here, uh, 4, 7, and 12. Um, and for each mutation, uh, homozygous mutation, when we were doing the um, back-crossing and, and selfing, we also selected lines which were also uh, homozygous for the wild-type uh, allele. Um, so that these lines also contain some of the background mutations that you get through the tilling pro uh, process. Um, to give us more confidence that what we're seeing um, here is actually due to the mutations that we're, we're targeting and not mutations uh, uh, in the background. Um, so we phenotyped them and looked at the calcium concentrations in the leaves uh, and for two of our lines um, we got a reduction in the calcium concentration present in the leaves relative to their wild types. Uh, but for one of them, we actually got an increase in the calcium concentration. Um, and I think this is one of the uh, benefits of the, uh, using the tilling population to generate an allelic series of mutations in your target gene, is you get, uh, rather than just a complete knockout uh, or a complete overexpression, you get more subtle uh, phenotypes coming through um, and indications of what residues are uh, important uh, in the functioning of, that, of those proteins. Um, and again, this is the magnesium concentration uh, in these lines, uh, and we got a reduction in, in two and an increase uh, in, uh, in the third line. So uh, in summary, uh, micronutrient deficiencies uh, are widespread, not just in the developing world. We have them uh, in, in, uh, in the UK and, and the Western world as well. There are a range of strategies that we can use to combat them, but not all of them are appropriate, uh, and you need to address them on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, hopefully I've convinced you that Braskers are a good candidate for increasing calcium and magnesium um, and that CAX1 is uh, uh, an important target for manipulating those leaf concentrations. So, so don't forget to eat your greens. Um, <clears throat> so I'll uh, just thank uh, a number of people, Martin Broadley's group, in particular Neil and, and Joe Lachlan, who worked on the CAX1 tilling population. Uh, Phil White and Lionel uh, at James Hutton, who, who helped with the Braska work in, in the uh, root um, uh, imaging and modelling. Uh, Lars Ostergaard's group at JRC for supplying seeds and the, the RevGen UK. Uh, Chris Rawlings' group at Rothamsted who helped with the bioinformatics of the uh, biofortification project with Artem Lysenko and Pierre. Uh, Graham King's group at Southern Cross University have been helping with the epigenetic um, work uh, that we've just been doing. Uh, and our funders. And I just want to finish by uh, at sort of advertising. Uh, we've got, I've got a new project starting um, in January this year, which is a four year BBSLC project looking at phosphorus cycling in the rhizosphere and the role of the plant and the microbe in that interaction. Um, and there's a, a, it's, it's a four year project with Warwick and, and Cranfield universities, and uh, there's a job advert going out this week for a, a postdoc, three year postdoc as part of that. So uh, thank you for your time.